Welcome to Monday Night Meetup. I'm your host, Suzanne Estrella, the Commonwealth Victim Advocate. This is a safe space for thoughtful reflection and honest conversation. This conversation is being recorded. There's no expectation of privacy. It will be uploaded to our YouTube channel at a later date so folks can watch and learn at their convenience. And it's also being streamed uh, live through our Facebook. Tonight, we are gonna be talking with a panel of guests about the proposed sentencing guidelines. I'm pleased to have with us Mark Bergstrom, the Executive Director of the Pennsylvania Commission on Sentencing, along with crime survivors, Colleen Kenny and Stephanie Urban. Handling all our technical assistance needs is Ashley, my Executive Assistant. So if you have some questions, please feel free to chat, type them into the chat and Ashley will let us know and we'll get your questions answered. Before we jump into the discussion, I wanna show you this video. It's really short. It just speaks to the heart of why we do what we do. Watch this and then we'll be right back. One of the greatest sounds in the universe is a child's laughter. A happy child laughs 400 times a day. Unfortunately, just three months into this year, in my city, 93 lives have been stolen by guns, 329 human bodies violated by bullets. That's nearly one murder a day, four shootings a day. So many lives forever changed. Gun violence doesn't just kill the ones we love, it lessens our laughter. It silences our smiles. It breaks our hearts. What do I do with my empty seat at the dinner table? With a silhouette where his college graduation photo would have been? With my anticipation of his first daddy-daughter dance? Tell me how we prevent what happened to me from happening to another mom who wants her child to live long enough to be old. Tell me how we heal the hate and stop the pain. Can we start over? Do you remember what it felt like to walk down the street without fearing for your life? Sleeping with your doors unlocked? Knowing and loving your neighbor, or at least caring enough to work it out without shooting it out? When did we become the society that kills over a parking space or shoots into a crowd where children play? How do we get back to love? Crime is preventable. What we do and say matters. We all have a part to play in creating safer, caring communities where justice thrives. The Office of Victim Advocate is the state agency with the duty and authority to advocate for the individual and collective rights of all crime survivors. The Sexual Offender Registration and Notification Act was created to inform communities of known sex offenders. For more information, visit pameganslaw.state.pa.us. For more information on all OVA services, visit ova.pa.gov. Thanks, Ashley. That just summarizes uh, how important crime prevention is to us. What we hear from every survivor is what they want most is for what happened to them to never happen to anyone else. And all of this work that we do just plays into that. So tonight we're really happy to be talking about the uh, proposed changes to the sentencing guidelines. Now I will admit that, you know, I'm an attorney, that is my background, but I do not understand the sentencing guidelines at all. I think they are so complicated. So we went straight to the top and that's why we have Mark here tonight so that hopefully he can bring some understanding, help us understand how all this uh, works together and you know how we can collectively as a community really um, speak into this and make these changes that are gonna be impactful and worthwhile for our communities. So Mark, um, briefly take us back to the beginning. Tell us what are sentencing guidelines and how did you get involved in this work? Well, first, thanks, Suzanne, for uh, having me here this evening, and I appreciate this opportunity. Um, sentencing guidelines were established, at least in Pennsylvania, back in the 80s. And the idea was 
that there should be greater uniformity in sentencing. And that doesn't mean all sentences should be the same or all sentences in all circumstances the same. What it means is there should be a common framework, a common starting point for sentencing. So the idea in sentencing guidelines is to create recommendations for judges to consider in every case in common pleas courts based on the seriousness of the conviction offense and the person's background. And so the idea is to identify based on individual factors um, that common starting point, the, the typical sentence for the typical offense for the typical offender. So pick the offense, you know, burglary, and we try to look at details of it. We try to look at the background of the individual and come up with a typical sentence. But what judges have to do is they have to consider a lot of individual factors when imposing a sentence. So we're just providing that framework or that starting point for all judges in the Commonwealth to start with the same sort of set of facts and then for them to look at the individual circumstances of the case and individualize the sentence. So that's what guidelines are about. Um, I worked in probation back in the 80s and in the early 90s, I know I'm getting old, but in the early 90s, um, the Commonwealth established a thing called county intermediate punishment, uh, sort of like probation with lots of conditions and restrictions. And um, I took a position with the Commission on Crime and Delinquency and the Commission on Sentencing to try to figure out how to build those things into sentencing guidelines and then how to work with counties to develop programs so that those things would be available in every community. And so I just sort of stuck with it. So I've been director of the commission going on 25 years. Wow. Yeah, time to leave, so. <laughs> No, I meant like, wow, you really are the expert. <laughs> That's awesome. I don't know about that. I've been at it a long time. Okay. So you said that there are recommendations. So then does that mean that it's not required that the judge start there at all? or? No. So really good question. Um, so they are recommendations in the in sort of the world of guidelines. There are what we call advisory guidelines and there are presumptive guidelines. So if you're familiar with things like mandatory minimum sentences, those are more like presumptive guidelines where courts must consider it and, and have a, a great difficulty going outside of those guidelines. Pennsylvania's are more like advisory guidelines, but, but here's the catch that makes them a little tougher than, than voluntary guidelines. Um, judges, must consider the guidelines in each and every case. So when a person is convicted of an offense, the court must consider the sentencing guidelines for each and every conviction offense before sentencing. And, and if the judge goes outside of the guidelines, that can be the basis of an appeal, an appeal by either party. So there's a, there's a built-in mechanism for the review of the guidelines by our appellate courts, generally the superior court but it can go to the Supreme Court. And the courts look at two factors, whether it was a legal sentence, did the judge do everything the judge was required to do? And then they look at the discretionary aspects of sentence. Did the judge exercise appropriate discretion in deciding on the sentence? So the guidelines provide sort of a framework for that type of um, consideration and review of, of sentences. Okay. So I tried to do some homework on this. Uh -oh. This is some language that I got from the um, commentary in the PA bulletin. Okay. So I'm just going to read a statement and then I want you to explain it to us and tell us like what that looks like in practice. Sure. Okay. This first one is targeted sentence recommendations. What's that? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought there was more. That's it, yeah. <laughs> so um, <laughs> so um, targeted sentence recommendations in the guidelines, as, as I said, if we were going to do like a guidelines 101, the first thing I would ask you for a sentencing guideline recommendation is 
what was the conviction offense and the details of the conviction offense, because that's the most important factor in terms of coming up with a sentence recommendation. And then we would look at the person's what we call criminal history, their prior record score. And the combination of those two factors generally is the starting point for a range that we provide to the court for sentence recommendations. Now, if you think about what judges can do at sentencing, we, we think first about what we call the disposition of the case. Is the judge gonna place someone on probation, place them in county jail, send them to state prison? Those are sort of the big three, but there's other things. There's fines and restitution and community service and a lot of other things, but, but sort of the big three dispositions are probation, jail, and prison. And then the second factor is like, well, how long? How long is the person gonna be on probation or in county jail or in state prison? So when we talk about targeted sentence recommendations, what we, what we say is, the guidelines might be better if they were more focused on a specific disposition. So probation or jail or prison, not all three. And it's oh. duration of time, not like one day difference, but a bandwidth that sort of treats similar cases in a similar way. And what we find with our current guidelines is we give judges lots of discretion and, and they need discretion. But sometimes we're not giving enough of a recommendation. We're saying you can give probation or jail. Well, which is it? I mean, which are we recommending? And so under these guidelines, we're trying to be a little bit more focused in our recommendation. And that's primarily about the disposition. Keeping in mind that if we say jail and the judge sees all kinds of factors, the judge might say, well, no, you know, I'm going to go with prison or I'm going to go with probation. But I think it's better if the commission gives a little bit more focus in its recommendations. So that would be the targeted sentence recommendation we're talking about. Okay. Redirect the primary focus of the recommendations on factors associated with the conviction offense. That's a lot. It sounds like something I wrote. So, I <laughs> know this. Um, so here's the thing. Uh, as I said, there, there are two key factors in a sentence recommendation. The how much weight we give to the current conviction offense and how much weight we give to the prior record score, the criminal history. If in, in everything we've written, as long as we've had guidelines since the early 80s, we always say the most important factor at sentencing is the current conviction offense. But if you look at our guidelines, especially what we call sort of the mid range of the guidelines, where we we sort of allow, we recommend everything, probation and jail and prison. Um, if you look at those guidelines, a, a person's prior record score could increase the basic sentencing recommendation by as much as nine times. Because at the low end for a, a, per, a first time offender, the recommendation might be fairly low. But when we get to a person that has an extensive criminal history, we go way up, we, sometimes nine times. So if, if we believe what we say, that the focus should be on the current conviction offense, then the argument is we should give less weight to criminal history. So maybe that means we increase the recommendations for first-time offenders, but the bottom line is we should try to scale these a little bit different. And what we find is for, for more serious and violent offenders, we do sort of hold that, you know, that doubling provision, but we start with much higher sentences. So a doubling, you know, is, is a lot more time, but, you know, it's, you know, if you're starting at 10 years, you're doubling up to 20 years. But if you're down recommending, you know, a month and you give, you, you go up to several years, you can see how that could be way more than double what the base thing is. So we're just trying to rethink that and trying to um, make sure that the prior record score doesn't drive the sentence, that the current conviction offense drives the sentence. And would that be the same then as reduce the impact of the prior record? Yeah, I, th I think it would, or try to equalize it, or try to be a little bit more thoughtful about how we do it. For instance, in talking with prosecutors, one of the things that 
um, that I think they think are, is important and what we hear from judges as well is that if someone has a repeat victimization or someone is involved in the same type of crime, maybe that's different than someone who has just random criminal offending. So, you know, maybe we have to think about what do we do for an offender who is repeating the same type, type of offending or where there are multiple victims? Like we should think about what we do at sentencing for those, not so much about the prior record score, but more about that offending behavior, that, that being part of the current conviction offense. It's like a repeat of the current conviction offense. So we have to just think more about how we, how we do that so that prior record score isn't this like independent thing that takes on a lot of weight, that we focus on the current conviction and things related to it. So that's what we're trying to get at. And if you think about like what the legislature has done, in a number of cases, they have built that into statute. They've done it with DUI and they've done it with other things where they say, if you're a repeat offender, we're going to increase the classification, the grade of that offense. And we might do it, you know, several times. So we're trying to look at that and see how we can use that as part of the guidelines rather than this just sort of big prior record score that doesn't maybe mean a whole lot in some cases. So how would those concepts apply? Let's just like take a, a random example. Let's say if we have an offender who um, uh, was convicted for like assault, battery of a domestic violence situation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes then he has another girlfriend and does it again. Mm -hmm. So are we saying, like, do how did, how would that work in that a situation like that? Yeah, that's that's what we're trying to look at. So so again, um, I could show you pretty charts that might help to explain this, but let me just sort of talk through it. We okay. have something called a matrix. So it's if you think about that first thing I talked about in terms of um, the seriousness of the current conviction offense, we have a um, right now we have a fifteen point scale. So if you have a really serious offense like murder three, that would be at the top of the scale, 15. And if you have like a misdemeanor three or an unclassified misdemeanor offense, it would be down at the bottom, one or two, something like that. So the higher the number, the more serious the offense. But we only have 15 categories. So you think of all the criminal offending, it, it, there's a lot. And so we group together a lot of like similar offense or, or things that might not be as similar as they should be. So Part of our direction with these new guidelines is to have more of those categories, like double it, go up to like 30 categories so that we can be more discriminating, saying these kind of offenses fit together and these things should warrant county jail or state prison or probation. So we want to be a little bit more discriminating that way. So, so if you have that model in place that you have like more categories, and there's like a almost like a stair step that, you know, as you keep going up, it consistently or proportionally gets higher. Then you can think about like building around that model a step up when spe specific factors are in place. So, Suzanne, you mentioned domestic violence. So let's say there's a, you know, some type of assignment on this scale for simple assault or aggravated assault. Well, what, what if it involves a family member or a significant other? Well, you know, it, we don't have a domestic violence statute necessarily, but we, we can have an enhancement where we say, if this is against a significant other, we, we increase the, we sort of step it up by a step or two. So we can build into the guidelines under this new system a, a way to sort of accommodate or address those extra harms. And, and we could do the same thing if you have like a, the same kind of offending happening, or you have multiple victims in, in a criminal incident, multiple people have been harmed, or repeat victimization. So, so we, you know, there's a lot of things that were, that we've considered and put out for public comment. And those are the kind of things that we could do if we expand the scale and make it that you can sort of step up to accommodate those kind of things. Okay, let me move to the 
my other panelists here, um, we have Stephanie Urban and Colleen Kenny, who are crime survivors. And I want to ask you, um, we'll go, we'll start with Stephanie. Do you remember in your case, if anyone mentioned sentencing guidelines to you at all? They did. Um, we talked about it actually at a, a, a great, great deal. Um, the gentleman that had killed my sister, um, he was a wrong way drunk driver. It was actually his third DUI um, and his third DUI three times the legal limit. Um, so that that previous score played a big part in what he was going to to get charged with because again it was his third offense and it wasn't just this first time I mean he was only 27 and mm -hmm. he had already had his third DUI three times the limit but his 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 score was only a one um so unfortunately it didn't help a whole lot because it was one using the lower end of the scale, um, but the district attorney um, did talk to us about it. And actually, the the chart that he had spoke about, I had him pull that out and and, and show that um, show that to us. We were hoping his score would have been higher, but unfortunately, it was a one. So, um, but we did talk about that at a you know great length. Thank you for sharing. I appreciate that. Now, Colleen, I know yours did not go. Um, to a criminal case, but I know you also do a lot of advocacy. Do you hear um, survivors talking about sentencing guidelines or expressing concerns in any way? Yes, and that's that's why my curiosity um, really kind of targeted this this converse, this part of the conversation. Um, just be, because of not always trusting a in their own ability to follow through with the court system, or you know, people believing what's actually happened to them, um, especially with the charges like simple assault and harassment, which so often don't hold a whole lot um, until you, you know, violate a PFA or something like that. <clears throat> so I'm glad to hear that there's going to be consideration specifically for items like that. Right. Mark, what can a victim do if a sentencing guideline isn't followed. Do they have any recourse? Is that something they could discuss with the prosecutor or do you know if there's anything they could do? Sure. Um, so one of the, I think, advances that especially came out of the 1990s when we started to, we, you know, the, the General Assembly created the Office of Victim Advocate and, and there was a real effort on the Victim's Bill of Rights and prosecutors having victim um, victim advocates in the office, things like that. Um, I think there's an, there's sort of like an infrastructure in place now where there's a means by which a victim can communicate and work with the prosecutor to, to try to make sure his or her concerns are being heard and are, are part of the process. That was the that was the plan in the 90s when we went through all the special session on crime and and all mm -hmm. legislation. And and so there should be a mechanism to to take full advantage of that system. And part of it is having information. So information about. The movement of the case through the system, but but just as importantly, um, a conversation about. What's possible? what's practical, what, what may or may not happen. Because there are you know, difficult conversations that prosecutors have to have with individuals who are victims of crime that, that have to do with you know, what can we expect to happen in the courtroom? You know, and, and I think knowing what the guidelines are, knowing the discretion courts have, but also knowing what has to be proven at trial and how difficult that can sometimes be are, are just important discussions and considerations. And so I think um, the more an individual knows about those details and about what the guidelines are and things like enhancements to the guidelines, the more that they can be engaged in the process or familiar with what's going on. And if things go off track, I think they can can you know bring that to the attention of the prosecutor 
or they can work through the Office of Victim Advocate and others to really try to draw attention to that issue. So I think I think it's an you know there was a lot of work that was done to to make sure there was a right to victims of crime, and I think it's important that you then exercise that right. And so um, I think you know there's sort of the macro stuff like policy stuff and that that that's sort of the space I work in, but mm -hmm. but there's the individual case, the individual victim, the individual offender that that I think that gets to the relationship with the um, with the prosecutor, but also with the court, you know, the ability to provide comment during a sentencing hearing and things like that. I think these are just important tools that have to be taken advantage of. Right. Tell us a little bit more about enhancements. Sure. How does that work? Yeah. So so I, I talked about the two basic components of guidelines, the offense gravity score and the prior record score. Um, and, and those cover like a lot of the space that we deal with in terms of coming up with sentence recommendations. Um, and I don't wanna get too like legal on this, but, but he, here's a, a couple of things to keep in mind. When someone is charged with an offense, the definition of the offense and statute has a number of what we call elements of the crime, things that the prosecutor has to prove at trial to get a conviction. And, and so those elements have to be satisfied. They have to be proved beyond a reasonable doubt in order to get a conviction. Mm -hmm. A conviction is the starting point for sentencing, for our sentencing guidelines. But there are sometimes factors that aren't proven at trial, that aren't elements of the crime, that are important factors to consider in sentencing. So let me give you an example. Let's say someone uh, assaults another person and, and our assault statutes are not great. We have simple assault and aggravated assault and there's a lot of work that can and should be done in just re reworking our assault statutes. And there's been efforts over the years, I, I hope someday it happens, but we have what we have. And so, so with our assault statutes, someone could, um, could injure you in a, in a substantial way. And it might be, if, it, if it's not serious bodily injury as defined in statute and by the courts, it would result in being a simple assault. And a simple assault, if it doesn't involve a victim under 13, is at the most a misdemeanor two offense, the maximum of which is two years. So you could see some very serious injuries that aren't serious bodily injury that end up at a maximum, a two year maximum for the sentence. So that's just a reality of the situation. But let's say you have an assault that is an aggravated assault and it, it's a felony, so it provides much more sort of latitude in sentencing. Well, the details of that assault may impact the type of sentence a court would give. One of the things enhancements does is it identifies factors that don't have to be proven at trial, but are important at sentencing. And I'll give you one example is what we call the deadly weapon enhancement. So the enhancement says that if you're convicted of an offense, an element of which is not a deadly weapon, but you commit a crime with a deadly weapon, at sentencing, we increase the sentence recommendation. We say to the court, at sentencing, make a determination about whether a deadly weapon was present. And here's the thing, at sentencing, the court makes decisions based on what we call a preponderance of the evidence. It's like a 50-50 thing. It's just a little bit more likely to be present. That's way different than at trial where it's like, you know, proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Yeah. So at sentencing, courts can consider these other factors, which we call enhancements, that would increase the sentence recommendation because of important factors that are present, like a deadly weapon. And our deadly weapon enhancement, we have one if someone possessed a weapon during the commission of the crime. And we have a second one that's higher if someone used the weapon during the commission of the crime. So that's just one example. We have like 20 some enhancements, but that's, that's an example of one. 
And do you feel that these the enhancements are being um, applied correctly? Like, do you see that all the counties are using it or is it different county to county or? Yeah, it, it's different and it's troubling. Um, you know, the commission spends a lot of time coming up with guidelines that, you know, we have public hearings on guidelines, things like that. And we have, we have a process in place to try to encourage the use of these. And in fact, if you read the guidelines, the court is required to sentence recommendation based on an enhancement if the court finds it to be present. So there, there's it's like a two-step process. The first step is, what is the sentence recommendation? And what the commission says is, when you're when someone's at sentencing, they've been convicted of an offense, you figure out the prior record score. If any of these factors for which there's an enhancement are determined to be present, then the court is required to calculate the guidelines, including that enhancement. So that's like the first step in the process. Let's start with, let's figure out what that common starting point for sentences, what that recommendation should be. That's the first step in the process. The second step then is the court to decide on an appropriate sentence. So the court looks at that recommendation with the enhancement, and then the court decides if that's appropriate or not. And the court has the discretion to sentence outside of that recommendation, to go below it, to go above it. Um, all the court has to do is give reasons for doing that. Um, so our frustration is when there's a shortcutting of the process and whether the prosecutor doesn't include it or the court doesn't build it into the sentence recommendation when those enhancements aren't even considered when they should be. That, that's, that's a concern. We, we know judges should exercise discretion, but we want the guidelines to be calculated appropriately from the start. Now, let me ask this, just as a matter of process, and then I see we have one question in the chat. I'm going to get to that next. But as a matter of process, is it the prosecutor that prepares the recommendation to the judge, or are the, the judges themselves going yeah. through all of the... Sure. <laughs> so, so there, you know, there, there's never a simple answer to any of this, but I'll, I'll give it a shot. So the... Um, we have to keep in mind that um, in, in all of these matters, the burden is on the prosecution, right? The burden of proof, the, the prosecutor has to prove the elements at trial. And at sentencing, if you're alleging or coming up with a recommendation based on prior record score, the burden on that is, is on the prosecution. They would have to prove at sentencing just by a preponderance of the evidence that the factors of the prior record score are correct or that the enhancement is correct or whatever. So, so there, is a, there is a role, an important role for prosecutors. Um, but, but the responsibility for the guidelines vested, is vested with the judge. The judge is responsible for making sure the guidelines are prepared and prepared accurately. And so, um, so each county develops their own way of doing it. So for the guidelines, we have a we have a web-based application. It's in JNet, the Justice Network. So we have this, this application that all county courts have access to. And it calculates the guidelines based on the information that's entered and then um, provides a guideline form for each conviction offense. So the court decides who in the county prepares that. And uh, in many counties, the court decides it's the DA's office, but in other counties, it might be the probation department, might be the judge's law clerk. It could be whoever that court decides is going to prepare the guidelines. And then there's a second part of the process. Once the court imposes a sentence, someone in the county has to enter that sentence into the same system. And that's how the commission receives sentencing data, receives information on sentences actually imposed. So it's a two-part process. Okay, so it still sounds like though, the best bet for the victim is to get with that prosecutor. Yep. To get your questions answered, express your concerns, ask maybe pointed questions even about what enhancements were possible, were they considered, things like that. 
Absolutely. And and look, prosecutors have a, a tough job, but that's what's so great about all the work in the 90s to make sure that there are, you know, are is support for victims at the county level in the DA's office. So there's a, a pathway for considering those things. And, and in many cases, in just answering questions, because it it may be a very complicated matter, and the, and you know the prosecutor might be thinking of you know the, the best way to to manage this case to get the best outcome. But you know anyone who's a victim of crime should should be aware of if if he or she wants to like those details and understand it. And I think prosecutors try to do that. Okay, here's some questions. Colleen's asking: Is there is there a definition of deadly weapon? Knives, guns, crossbow. There, there is, and well, there, there's more than one. There are several definitions of deadly weapon, but for the purposes of the sentencing guidelines, we we select one of those definitions from statute and we use that. It's a broad definition, so it it involves not only firearms and different types of firearms, but also knives and and other things like that. So it's a it's, it's a pretty broad definition. And then the courts helped us to broaden it, especially when we talk about deadly weapon used, because as, as you know, just about anything could be a weapon in the way it's being used, right? A baseball bat or something like that. So something that is a weapon for purpose of possession, that actually might be a narrower category than when something is used or threatening to be used. That that might be a broader category. So, um, you know, it gets sort of technical, but but we have a pretty broad definition in place. Okay, we have another question in the chat. Is there a PA restorative justice process that can impact post-sentence to reduce sentence after the offender is incarcerated? Well, there, there's a couple of things that we have in place. Um, and, and some of this is very county centric because as you probably know, our courts, although we have a, a unified judicial system, our courts really do operate at the county level. And, and for restorative justice, for, for any number of things, it, it is very much you know, what that county puts in place. Now, one thing that the Commission on Crime and Delinquency has done over the years, and I think this is a really positive thing, is they've really encouraged the development of what are called criminal justice advisory boards or CJABs in each county so that you get all of the people together in a room on a regular basis, including victim advocate and others at the county level to sort of think through policies and try to look for best approaches. There's been a lot of work on things like restitution, and restorative justice, but some counties are either, um, you know, have the resources or are, are focused on that more than other counties. So it becomes a sort of county by county basis. But if, if but you know, it's it's an area of certainly of advocacy in terms of trying to to promote and 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 spotlight those kind of things. Okay. Someone else is asking, does the commission proactively review sentence criteria on cases? We, so we don't have standing to appeal cases. So we are, you know, we are a sort of a policy organization. As I said, we collect data. So we have, we have mandates and we have some authority and the authority is that we adopt guidelines and not just for sentencing, for resentencing, for parole, for recommitment, uh, and we do other things with risk assessment, what have you. So we have a, a number of responsibilities. And then linked to those, we are there are mandates on courts or the parole board or others to actually consider our guidelines. And then there is a requirement for decision makers to report those decisions to us. And then the commission is responsible for collecting, analyzing, and disseminating information. And so if you go to our website, pasentencing.us, um, you, you would be able to go in there and you'll see that we have um, a, a data dashboard on sentencing. You can run reports on sentencing by judge, by offense, 
Uh, we have data that are going back at least 10 or 15 years that you can, you can analyze on your own. We have little tools that help you. But these are, you know, it's, it's part of this broader package of trying to collect information and get it out to the public. Um, and so while we can't, you know, we can't appeal a case, we can certainly analyze cases. We can identify outlier cases. We can do um, research and evaluation around those things. And let me give you just one example of how we try to like harness all this stuff and sort of put it into action. Uh -huh. Last year, the commission, last December, I guess, the commission received a mandate from the House of Representatives. So a House resolution, HR 111, that mandated the commission to do a study of um, violations of the Uniform Firearms Act, so VUFA. Um, and so we are only given six months, so a lot of work in a short period of time. But um, the, the study had six directives. And, and sort of at the core, one of the directives was follow arrests and see what happens. So if someone is charged with a violation of the Uniform Firearms Act, track that and let us know what happens. You know, do, are the cases dismissed? Are they, do, are they, do they end up as non-guilty uh, determinations? Are they found guilty of the same offense or a lesser offense? And what kind of sentence flows from that? So we call that attrition, where you're just sort of flowing the case through the system, but you're doing with all the cases. So we were supposed to look at five years of data, all boof of violations, and see how the cases progress through the system. And then a separate part was, well, did it work? Whatever was done, did it work? Like when sentences were imposed, what was the recidivism? How often did the people reoffend? And what about if they were on community supervision like probation or parole? What about pretrial? So it you know it's a lot to do in a short period of time, but our the report is out on our website. We submitted it to the General Assembly on June 30th. So if you go to our website, pasentencing.us, um, I think on our home page or whatever you call that page now, um, there, there should be the report, HR 111. And you can you can get a sense of what the commission tries to do in taking this information, taking our guidelines, taking all of that, and trying to provide information to inform the public, to inform courts, and to inform the General Assembly, because we, the commission, is a legislative agency. So part of our job is to inform the General Assembly to make policy changes when warranted. So that's our, our shtick. All right. Okay, Colleen, I'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit. Tell us about what offender accountability, what does that mean to you as a crime survivor? So offender accountability, I think to me involves everything, whether it's being accountable for the, you know, crimes that were committed against, you know, the actual victim, um, serving whatever the justice system may feel that is, um, as well as actually having the offender do work around that themselves. Um, so, you know, in my case, I didn't necessarily go through a criminal route. Um, I took the civil and I like that there's those options um, because, I feel like there's, you know, as we spoke about earlier, there's ways that there's crimes that are lower that may have um, less different type of traumatic impact versus very serious crimes and circumstances around them. So I think for me, I wasn't so focused on the actual finding justice for that the offender. I was more focused on them trying to get help um, in order to not do this again in the future. So I went the route, the route in which I thought would help best do that. Um, so I think that's for myself, that's how I view it. I know everybody um, views it differently talking to different domestic violence victims I've worked with, it, it ranges. Um, so I definitely think a lot of people do put a lot more thought in more than just the justice system, but also feel like that's something that does often have to play a role. 
in order to make change. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that perspective and it kind of shows it kind of connects with the video that we showed um, opening up talking about crime prevention and how all these pieces of the puzzle fit together. But Mark, when we talk about the sentencing guidelines, do you feel that the commission has kind of taken all that into consideration um, to address, you know, offender accountability and how that could possibly look differently? Yeah, I think we try to, but um, if if you think about, like one of the principles is what we call purposes of sentencing. And um, if you think, if you look into justifications for sentences, uh, you could see that two judges might have a different purpose in mind when sentencing, and the outcome would look very different, even though they're working from the same starting point, the same sentencing guidelines. So we often think in terms of like two categories. One is, is retribution, so accountability. You know, sometimes the guidelines, the, the focus is on holding someone accountable. And that might be through any number of means, and it could be in the community and it could be in an institution. But, you know, the, the whole idea of sort of the structure of guidelines is really about retribution, about um, uniformity and proportionality and punishment. But the other side of the equation is what are the more utilitarian purposes, things like deterrence, trying to deter someone or communities from committing crimes. We have um, incapacitation, locking someone away to, to protect the community, um, rehabilitation, trying to deal with drug dependency, mental health issues, other things like that that can be drivers of, um, of crime and, and victimization. And so, so, you know, you have to develop guidelines that can like accommodate those things. So what we've tried to do over time is our, our basic guidelines are built around retribution. Um, but then we overlay mechanisms for courts to use other purposes or try to achieve other purposes. So we do have trade-offs that allow for problem-solving courts for drug-dependent individuals, where we use clinical recommendations about treatment as a, as a mechanism for courts to determine you know, is that the better approach than this? So, so we try to build those things in. And, and we have tried over time to build in concepts of restore of justice, but it, it's, it's a little bit tough within our guidelines, but we have spent a lot of time um, working through our research partnerships with Penn State and others to really um, focus on things like victim restitution, um, collection methods that are more appropriate or more successful. And the relationship between paying restitution and reduced reoffending. Um, and you know, one of the things we find, and this is not just with restitution, it's also with things like, like um, deterrence. We have to make sure people know why we're doing what we're doing. You know, if a judge is imposing a sentence, part of the equation is to explain why that sentence is being imposed. If you're paying this money. We should, you should know that it's going towards restitution, not towards like fines and costs. It makes a difference if you know why you're doing what you're doing, that you're being held accountable for this thing instead of, oh, I just, you know, the judge just did this. So that information is really helpful in being more successful in implementing these programs, having safer and better outcomes in communities. Uh, but it, it's a lot of tough work, but uh, we try to, build that into the guidelines. I like that. That's, I think I agree with that. That is really important that the offender know what that money is going to. Yeah, that, that would be much more impactful. We've got another question that came through. I think it's probably a little bit outside of what you all do, what you can touch on it if you would like. Once the defendant takes a plea, there's no trial. Does the prosecutor need to let the victims know about the plea before accepting the plea? Do the victims have a say on the plea discussion with the prosecutor? It's my understanding, but Suzanne, you would be the one who would. <laughs> but it's my understanding that under the Victim Bill of Rights, that the victim should be aware of that. It's it. There's not a veto, but but an awareness and a discussion of those things. I thought was 
one of the yes. parts of the victim bill of rights. That is, I don't think it's in it's it's in the sentence and guidelines, but yeah. that is one of the, the one of the rights that the victim is supposed to be made aware of those yeah. discussions. They don't really have the authority to say yes or no, but it's it's designed so that they can kind of speak into that so the prosecutor would know what the victim feels and what they want and try to work together on that. So that is supposed to be happening. If it's not happening, you can file a complaint that your rights have been violated um, through the Office of Victim Advocate and that is something that we can help you to address. Okay, let me ask you this. Do the sentencing guidelines in any way um, address bail or bail requirements? Um. No, it, it doesn't. There, there's two sort of related issues, though. One is the commission received a mandate several years ago to develop a risk assessment or to identify a model risk assessment for domestic violence um, bail decisions. So a risk assessment focused on domestic violence for bail decisions or pretrial decisions. And we we identified ODARA, which is an instrument out of developed in Ontario um, that, that has been used and, and validated in a lot of jurisdictions in the US and, and certainly in Canada um, that looks like a really promising um, instrument. We, we haven't done much work since then because um, at the time we submitted our report, um, COVID hit. And so, um, but we've had recent discussions. I think by the end of the year, the commission will submit a report to the General Assembly about um, other things to look at there, maybe some additional work to do looking at that. But that's been our, our biggest um, connection with pretrial. The only other thing I'll mention is that, you know, there it, it's a really important part of our system. And, and it it's so fractured and splintered, and we have so many decision makers and, and um, you know, one of the, it's sort of a missed opportunity at times. You know, it's its sometimes a missed opportunity, free trial space to protect the community. And sometimes it's a missed opportunity um, to get a defendant into the, onto the right track, into treatment, something like that, that can be beneficial, you know, longer term. Um, so I just wish we did a whole lot more at the pre-trial space, because I, I think, it could help protect the community, but also I think help individuals that have their like initial contact with the with the system. How does the commission gauge the success or failure of the sentencing guidelines? Yeah. How did you decide that these proposals were changes were needed? Yeah. Um, well, you know, there's a couple measures. One is um, what we call conformity to the guidelines. So are the judges sort of sentencing within the guidelines or outside of the guidelines. But I'm a big fan of saying judges should exercise discretion because these are like guidelines are, are sort of macro and judges are making individual decisions. So I have, I have no concern of guidelines if judges sentence outside the guidelines. But, but what is helpful and should happen is they should provide reasons for why they're doing that. Because if we find that we're consistently wrong it, with a certain type of case, it could be that we're missing a factor that that's really important to courts, and we should build it into the guidelines to promote better practices. So, so that's um, those are some sort of feedback mechanisms. But um, but I think you know how do we know if we're doing it right? Well, we, we're engaged um, with with practitioners, and we we try to hear to both sides. And I I think the common thing is. If both sides are upset with you, you might be in the right space. <laughs> that, that's true. But, but we we try to work with both prosecutors and defense attorneys and with the court that that they generally are viewing what we're doing as fair and and um, appropriate. And we hope that the same is true of individuals who are victims of crime that they feel that the guidelines are appropriate. And, and for defendants as well, they might not agree with them, but we think in order to be viewed as fair and appropriate, we need all parties to sort of view it as like, as, as appropriate, I, I think. And that's a tough thing to do to balance all of those interests. But I think if you, if you do that, that people think, you know, this 
in like when you're not thinking about your own case and you're looking at it generally like this makes sense it's a good starting point it's what the judges should start with and then look at the particular facts of the case i think that if we're doing that i think we're doing we're on in the right place is there an avenue for victims to provide that type of feedback to the sentencing commission absolutely first um I mentioned before our website, pasentencing.us. Please feel free to check things out there, but you can send an email. I mean, my contact information is there, but the commission has a generic contact information. Whenever we do um, guidelines, like we're going through the process right now, we have public hearings. So when we published what we call the working draft of proposals in January about this set of guidelines we're looking at, we held six public hearings and we will do that again because our process, when we're getting ready to adopt guidelines, which we hope to do later this year, the commission will approve a set of guidelines, draft guidelines, and we'll publish them and have public hearings. And then the commission will meet again. And when they finally adopt those guidelines, then we have to submit them to the general assembly the General Assembly has 90 days to review them, and if they don't reject them, then they go into effect. So it's a pretty long process, but it's purposely built around engagement with practitioners, with victims, with everyday ordinary, whoever wants to comment can comment, and then there's a legislative review process. So where are you in that process now? We are, we've been working on this, these proposals since 2014. Now, during that period of time, we've also adopted guidelines. So we were like working two track, like long term and short term. So um, these proposals we've been working on, um, we are hoping, um, I'd say either at our September meeting or December meeting to approve draft guidelines for public hearings. And that would put us on track to have public hearings later this year, or early next year, possibly adopt and submit to the General Assembly these guidelines as early as perhaps March of next year. And then they probably take effect January 1st of 2024. So we're long-term, we're, wow. it's been a lot well, of- We certainly appreciate um, the work that you all do. Like I say, it's such a collaborative effort and um, everybody has a part to play in creating safer, caring communities where justice thrives. And we certainly appreciate the part that you play. And we appreciate you taking time to explain all this to us tonight. And I'm sure we may have more uh, questions come in that we will send over to your website. And we just Feel appreciate free. that. And that thank you good. so much, um, Colleen, for, for joining us as well. We appreciate you um, sharing your perspective. Now, Mark, before we end, I just got um, a couple of rapid fire questions. That okay. Have nothing to do with sentencing guidelines. It's just kind of like fun to kind of just point to the, the, the point that we all have so much more in common than our differences and just want to give you an opportunity to share some of that. Okay. Sure. So you don't think about it, you just answer right away. Okay. Your I'll try. favorite superhero Superman. <laughs> Summer or winter? Winter. Monday or Friday? Friday. Favorite color? Blue. Coffee or tea? Coffee, lots of. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Thank we you. We appreciate you. And uh, like I said, I'm sure we're gonna have more questions and you'll probably get some more on your website, but thanks well, again. And thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Colleen, and thanks, um, Stephanie. Really appreciate it. All right. Good night, everyone.